family. Jesus Christ is alive, and that changes everything about today. What a beautiful morning to come, to gather together with the body of Christ and encourage one another to point one another to Christ and the glorious gospel that Jesus died for our sins and rose again. Amen? Amen. This morning, our call to worship is the, is the, is the passage that inspired the song we opened with this morning. A mighty fortress. So this is Psalm 46, and it says this. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. We can trust him. The Lord is our refuge. He is all that we need. He will walk with us through every difficulty. And as we continue to sing, I want to stay on that, on that concept of his holiness, of his goodness, of his righteousness. As we continue to sing this morning, we'll sing, He is our God.
continue to worship this morning. Consider his goodness. Do you feel the world's broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deep? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do.
please open or turn on uh, your Bibles to Psalm 108 and read along with me as we continue uh, praising the Lord. And if your Bible, uh, a lot of them have titles and headings, uh, things like that, uh, in the English Standard Version, here's this, this one, the title, With God We Shall Do Valiantly. Uh, that's taken from uh, the last uh, couple, the last verse of the psalm. Uh, but you'll see here, uh, the psalmist praising the Lord, uh, extolling his name, and then at the very end, you have this little one aside where it's like, have you rejected us? Um, God, are you with us? Because we can't do this without you. But then with God, we shall do value. Um, that he is the one that's going to do these things. And it's just beautiful. So read along with me in Psalm 108. A song, a song of David. My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make melody with all my being. Awake, O harp and lyre, I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your steadfast love is great above the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth, that your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation by your right hand and answer me. God has promised in his holiness. With exultation, I will divide up Shechem and portion out the valley of Succoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is my helmet. Judah, my scepter. Moab is my wash basin. Upon Edom, I cast my shoe. Over Philistia, I shout in triumph. Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Have you not rejected us, O God? You do not go out, O God, with our armies. O grant us help against the foe, for vain is the salvation of man. With God, we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. Amen. Pray with me. O Lord our God, we praise you, along with David uh, and all those who have come before, Lord. Your name is great, and greatly to be praised. Uh, high above the heavens is your name, and we wish to join in singing praises to you, because you are worthy, Lord. You have made us, you have made all things. Uh, not only have you made them, but you sustain them by the word of your power, Lord, and you sustain us today. Lord, thank you. Let us be those who are constantly extolling your name among, among the nations, Lord. Um, those who would proclaim you to the widest parts of the earth or in our homes, with our neighbors, in our workplaces, Lord. Lord, let it be our greatest desire to see your name be lifted up and magnified to all who would hear it. Lord, I pray even for our city today uh, as there are other churches uh, who are proclaiming your name. Lord, thank you that we are not a pillar alone upholding the truth, Lord, but we are one of many in your church uh, who are teaching the same things, preaching the same things, singing praises to you, O oh God. Lord, be magnified throughout this city. Let your gospel be known and let lives be saved, O oh Father. Lord, we know uh, that without you, uh, this work does not get done. We can say all the right things, we can set up the right programs, uh, have the right training, or but you are the one who brings all these things to pass. You are the one who has called, and you are the one who softens hearts, and you are the one who saves, Lord. Uh, Lord, I pray that that would be our hope, and that we would rest upon it, Lord, and that you would be doing that saving work even here this morning with us. Now, Lord, I pray as we continue in worship, both in song and through the preaching of your word, Lord, that you would be pleased with our worship, uh, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth, uh, and that, Lord, in the preaching of your word, you would work through your Holy Spirit to reveal it and enlighten it in our hearts and that we would be changed. It's in Jesus' name that we pray all of these things. Amen. 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 At this time, our children, ages three and under, are invited to the children's building, which is out these doors to your right. The rest of us, let's stand together. We will continue to sing one more song before the preaching of the word. How deep the Father's love for us. Make the wretches free. 
Thank you so much, music team, for reminding us of the gospel this morning. I've so much enjoyed already here being with you and worshiping with you. It's always so good. I love these Sunday mornings, and I hope that you have grown to love Sunday mornings as well and make this just a regular part of your week, uh, one of the big rocks in your calendar that we can be reminded of who God is, of the gospel, and of the way that he loves us and gave himself for us. Uh, such a great time already today. We're going to be in Luke chapter 9, looking at verses 37 through 50 today. Luke chapter 9, verses 37 through 50. The title of our message is Part of Your Training. And this is uh, a title that perhaps only my kids can actually fully appreciate. I tell them this all the time when there's something I want them to learn, something I want them to do, is, hey, this is part of your training. I see the head nod over there of affirmation. You know, important things like learning how to change the oil on your car. Say, come here, I want to show you how to do this. This is part of your training. Or things like learning how to use a chainsaw. My wife loves it when I teach those lessons to the kids. Recently, doing taxes, part of your training, things you need to know. Or other important things like learning how to clean a fish. These are important things that you need to know in life, how to do it. And I say this all the time. This is part of your training. I think we could title what the disciples experienced today, part of your training. They've just come off this incredible experience of being commissioned out by Jesus. They're given authority in some level to preach the gospel and to actually heal and some authority over demons as well. But then these four little stories happen, and there's this demon that they get bested by that they can't actually cast out. And this kicks off a series of short little stories here, and we'll take the four of them in succession. And these four stories, they're structured a little bit differently. Most of the time when you see a miracle in the gospel accounts, the purpose of the miracle is explicitly to confirm and convey the identity of the person of Jesus Christ. That's what miracles are for, and that's how they're functioning. But what we have here is we have this first miracle and then these other stories, and they are really revolving around the disciples and preparing them for something that's about to happen. Jump down to verse 51. This is outside of our text. This will be next week. But I want to go ahead and put this in your mind. In verse 51, it says, When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. So, with that, we're going to back up and see that the disciples are just about to embark on a journey with Jesus. I've shown you this map a few times now here in the Gospel of Luke, if you're new with us. This is, I like to catch people up and kind of get the speed of the wave as we get into a text here today. What we have is most of Luke in the first parts until 951 is centering around his mission in Galilee. And so what we have in 951 is he's setting his face to go south. And the rest of the Gospel of Luke, after 951, is going to take place headed down to Jerusalem, which ultimately would lead to the crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So it's just before this, and the disciples need a little bit of training before they head off on this journey. And I think one of the themes that we'll see that becomes prominent through these four stories is the disciples had grown a little bit of a sense of pride. 
I think, it seems like, they were feeling themselves a little bit. And what Jesus is going to do is remind them and give them some lessons in humility. What an important message for all of us here this morning. So, lessons in humility for the disciples. Number one, lesson number one, they're going to get bested by a demon. They're going to encounter this demon that they can't deal with. Next, they're going to be confused by Jesus' teaching, but they're too prideful, actually, to stop and ask him what he actually means. We'll see that. They're going to be humbled by a child, and then they're going to be corrected for what we could call tribalism. They're going to be corrected for thinking that they're the only ones who can do ministry. So let's look at lesson number one. I'll read these just as we move along. So verse 37 says this. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him, so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him, and will hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out. They could not do it. Jesus answered, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. What an interesting passage. We've just come down. It notes that they came down off the mountain. This was the Mount of Transfiguration. So last week we talked about the Mount of Transfiguration. Such a cool story where Jesus goes up on the mountain and he is transfigured. It's a strange word, I know. And the glory of God shines not on Jesus like Moses when he went up on the mountain and he glowed because he had been in the presence of God. The glory comes from Jesus. Hebrews 1.3 says he is the radiance, meaning Christ, the radiance of the glory of God. It's radiating out of him, and he's the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. We spent some time last week talking about these two words, transcendence, bigness of God, and eminence, nearness of God, and how those really combine in the person of Christ. And I love being able to remind us that God is big and awesome and powerful. And Jesus gives his disciples, the three at least, on the mountain, he gives them a reminder and he gives them a preview of the glory that is in the person of Jesus Christ. So he comes down off the mountain. It's Jesus and the three, Peter, James, and John, who were up on the mountain with him. And the other nine have become embroiled in a little bit of a squabble down below. Because there's this demon-possessed child. The father is begging them to cast the demon out. And they're unsuccessful. They can't do it. They can't do it. Interestingly, there's some correspondence here between when Moses goes up on the mountain and he meets with God and he comes back down and there's this, there's this uh, scene that's going on with the golden calf incident. Interesting correspondence there. So that's the situation. Now, a number of times we've seen that Jesus already in Luke's gospel has shown them that he has authority over demons. Most recently in our study and memorably was the scene where he cast the thousands of demons into the herd of swine, the pigs, 2,000 of them. He casts these demons into the pigs. They run off a cliff and they drown themselves. So Jesus has established he has authority over the demons. And he had given the disciples on their short-term mission trip authority. But then there's this demon that just is stubborn and won't listen. What do we do with that? Actually, jump ahead again in Luke chapter 10. I think there's a lot of correspondence between chapters 9 and 10 that we'll see as we move along. Jesus is going to commission another short-term trip. This time, it's not just the disciples. It's 72 appointed messengers. And then when they return, verse 17, the 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So there's others that Jesus has given the authority to cast out demons. So why, why did the disciples get stuck on this one? Was it something about the demon? Was this a particularly stubborn demon? Did he just have roots a little bit deeper maybe into this individual? There's a lot we don't know about this, but let's just see what the text says. Verse 41, why were they not able to cast this one out? 
Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. So one of the reasons why they can't cast this demon out is because their lack of faith. Their lack of faith. I want to read you the parallel accounts. This is in Matthew 17 and also in Mark 9. So this story is recorded for us those three places. Luke 9, Matthew 17, and Mark 9. Matthew 17, 20. They ask the question... Why can't we cast out this demon? He said to them, because of your little faith. That's why. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you'll be able to say to this mountain, move here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. So the reason is your lack of faith. Mark records, Mark chapter 9. And when he had entered his, uh, the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? Same question. And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. So there's something different about this particular demon, whatever that is. It's mysterious again to us, but they can't cast it out. I think what Jesus is getting at in teaching his disciples is this is not just a formula. This isn't a magic trick that I've given you that you can just kind of exercise at will. The power to do spiritual things comes from God, not you. It doesn't originate with you. When my, we were younger, my little brother, um, my dad had convinced him. My dad loved to do things like this. My dad had convinced him that he had the power to change the, the TV in his finger. All right? So, and every, every self-respecting dad has tried this at some point. And you kind of hold the remote discreetly, and you say, and he points at the TV and you change it, and he points at the TV and you change it. And, you know, my, my brother's so excited because he has this magic power in his finger, and he's calling the whole family in. And says, hey, watch this. And we're all just, like, dying laughing because uh, it's, it's awesome. But then, you know, there was a day when he wasn't there, and my dad wasn't there to hit the remote. And my brother's just sitting there pointing at the TV like, <laughs> this thing's broken, like, looking at his finger, looking at the TV. Like, what's up with this? It's not working. It's not working. And he finally came to the realization, like, oh, wait, the power isn't in my finger. Uh, There's something else going on here. I think that's somewhat of what the disciples experienced at a far more serious level, obviously. They just thought they could cast out a demon because they had done it before. Jesus says, no, this isn't about you. It's about the power that I have given you to exercise. But they were doing it without faith and without prayer. He says, you can't, it's not gonna work that way. It doesn't work. Lack of faith and lack of prayer The disciples are coming along in their training, but they have a long ways to go. They've wrongly assumed that this is how it works. They've witnessed incredible things. They've even been able to do some incredible things. But this isn't a magic trick. It's not a magic trick. It's the power of God that was working through them. I think this plays into what happens at the end of our section here. Glance down to verse 49. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow us. So there's somebody at the end of the story that actually has success casting out demons. The disciples are like, hey, what's up with that? I think Jesus is teaching them, this power is not of you. It's of God. I have to admit, this really hits home for me as a pastor, somebody who stands up and teaches pretty often. I start thinking back over the number of times I've stood up in front of people and talked, and there can become a little bit of, those of us who do this in some regular capacity, there can become a little bit of a process you go through, and you just sort of crank out a sermon, and you preach a sermon, or you preach a Bible lesson, or teach a Bible lesson in your own context, And there may become some sort of an expectation that, well, it's just going to work. It's just going to work again. It's just going to happen. And I think we need to be cautious of that. Spiritual fruit happens by the Spirit of God. God uses his word. That, of course, is true. But it's by faith, and it's the Lord who must produce. The Lord has to do this. They get bested by this demon, and I think it's a lesson that they aren't quite as awesome as they think. I believe Nathan in his prayer mentioned this, that it's the Lord who produces spiritual fruit. I love what Paul says, 
1 Corinthians 3. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God gives the growth. The Lord is the one who gives the growth. And we need to be reminded of that. It's not about us. Or maybe you sharing the gospel with someone. Maybe you learned some new things. You read a new book. You read a new article. You came to the tough questions event. It's like, ah, I could use that argument. I heard one of the guys mention. And you try it, and people just look at you like, yeah, so? And it doesn't work. You're like, this system doesn't work. Like, well, it's not the system. It's God's power. The Lord has to give the increase. Don't forget that. They're bested by a demon for the purpose of reminding them that they have to be dependent on the Lord for this ministry. Next, that's lesson one in humility, bested by this demon. Number two, they're confused by Jesus' teaching. So Jesus does heal the boy. He rebukes this unclean spirit. Verse 43, and all were astonished at the majesty of God. Then continuing on in verse 43, but while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. Listen up, team. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. They're confused by Jesus' teaching. They move from a lesson about not being awesome to a lesson about what you don't actually know. You aren't quite as smart as maybe you think you are. There's still some things to learn and to know. So Jesus had told them back in verse 22, if you just glance back up to verse 22 just for a moment. Jesus had told them there, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So he's told them what's going to happen already. And now he comes back and he tells them again. This happens a few different times in the Gospel of Mark. But they don't get it. They don't get it. But in fact, there's something else going on here that I want to point out to you. This is the classic conversation about the sovereignty of God and what gets called the responsibility of man. Why don't they actually believe, are we told in this passage? But they did not understand this saying, and it was concealed from them. Well, that's interesting. It was concealed from them. Why don't they believe? Well, the short answer is they can't, actually, because it was concealed. So what do we do with that? So they might not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about the saying. Same thing happens again, just before the arrest and crucifixion. But they understood none of these things. Jesus again telling them, Son of Man's going to go. He's going to be killed. going to be raised on the third day. Because the saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. Interesting. We'll have to deal with Luke 18 another day when we get there in about a couple of years. We'll get there eventually. I actually outlined the entire Gospel of Luke, and it looks like it's going to take us 80 sermons, and this is number 40. So we're halfway there in terms of the, uh, the, the sermons, but we're going to move a little faster through the second half of the book. No promises. Okay, um, that's that. So we'll, we'll deal with that text a little bit more when we finally get there. But it's, a, it's such an interesting conversation that goes on here. It leads us into this conversation about the sovereignty of God. God has to reveal it for them to believe and the responsibility to believe. I made the point with our men's Bible study this last week in our nine o'clock study that the gospel is actually a command. You're commanded to believe. And so therefore, belief is a moral issue. <laughs> you, you are to believe in the gospel. First John 3.23, and this is his commandment. What is the commandment of God? That we believe so you're, you're commanded to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and that you love one another just as he commanded us. So why don't they understand? Well, it was veiled from them. A couple of things that I'll say about this, and we don't have time to take this fully apart this morning. I love what D.A. Carson said. He said, the sovereignty responsibility tension 
is not a problem to be solved, rather it is a framework to be explored. I appreciate that quote, and I'm helped by that. It's not a problem to be solved. These are sort of look to us like two parallel train tracks. In reality, it's not a problem, it's more of a framework to think within and through. But there's something else going on here that I want to point out to you. Look at verse 45 again. In verse 45, they did not understand the saying, it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. But then note, what does it say at the end? And they were afraid to ask. They were afraid to ask. There's kind of two types of people in the room here this morning when you don't know something in a like social situation especially. There are people who pretend like they know what's going on. That's probably many of you. I have a tendency to lean this direction. People start talking about something, you just kind of nod along like, oh yeah, yeah, I saw that, I read that, I know that. And you just, you don't really want to be exposed for, I have no idea what you guys are actually talking about, I don't understand what's going on. And you just kind of nod along like, oh yeah, 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 I get it. So there's that person. The other person is, you just stop and ask questions. You just kind of stop the whole, hey, what, what are you talking about? What does that mean? What, what you, you use this word, what, what was that word, and this and that. And that these, you know, incessantly curious people who just want to just want to understand and want to know so you probably fall in one of those you know there's a spectrum between obviously well the disciples fell on the side of we don't want to we don't really know what's going on but they didn't stop to ask they didn't bother to ask and jesus again is exposing their pride he's exposing their pride you don't know what's going on you haven't been able to cast out this demon you just saw me at least some of you saw me transfigured on the mountain and you need to stop and ask questions. You don't know everything that you think you know. We have to understand learning and comprehending spiritual truth isn't simply a matter of the intellect. And we're depending on the Lord to truly learn and grow. Pretending like you know what you're doing. Pretending like you know what's going on. It can get you in all sorts of trouble, can it? My cousin, he's, he's hilarious. Uh, after he graduated high school, he wanted to get away for a little bit, and so he decided to apply for a job as on a, at a ski resort up in Montana. And so on his application, they asked him a very obvious question, if you're going to work at a ski resort, how well do you ski? Like, do, can you ski? And he marked expert. <laughs> um, so... One of his first days on the job, he gets sent up to the top of the mountain to go to one of the buildings up top. Well, the only way down is to ski down the double black diamonds. Well, that obviously doesn't go well. Um, he finally kind of rolls his way to the bottom, um, and he goes, goes to talk to one of his bosses. And they're like, I thought you told us you could ski. He said, I can. I, I water ski really well. <laughs> he said, I kind of thought it was the same thing. I'm like, no, it's not the same thing. Not the same thing at all. The, the disciples are just, they, they hear Jesus, and it, what he's saying doesn't make sense to them, but they don't bother to, to dive into that and say, and humbly ask questions. We need some clarity on what's going on for this. We need some clarity. Help us understand. Some have called this spiritual pride. We have a certain spiritual pride. We need reliance and dependence on the Lord. We need to humbly come and ask the Lord to make clear to us the things that aren't clear. That would have been the appropriate response by the disciples. Next, next lesson in humility for the disciples. They didn't bother to ask what was going on. Verse 46. So you're seeing this theme of pride. We've already seen it already. And now we're going to see this explicitly here in verse 46. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is the greatest. As if we needed more evidence of their pride, they are actually having an argument about who is the best? Who is the greatest? Now, just imagine, imagine, this is not an exact parallel, but just think through it for a second. Imagine there's a group of pastors that get together, and I have groups of pastors that I meet with from time to time. And let's just imagine we're all in a room, and you're listening in, and we're having a conversation, and we're arguing about who the best pastor is. Now, 
what would you think of that? Like, well, actually, I think I'm the best pastor. Like, did you hear that sermon? I mean, did you, did you see? Do you know how many, how many personal visits I made in the last week? Do you, do you, I mean, have you read my emails? Some of you guys don't get my emails. You really should. Uh, it, actually, this week was a little late, but sorry about that. Uh, you, and could you imagine what you would think as somebody listening to an argument about pastors argue about who the greatest pastor is? Like, well, that's messed up. That's exactly what happens with the disciples, though. And it's not the last time, actually. This is recorded for us a few times. It's not a one-time conversation. So in Mark 9, which I have referenced here, Mark 10, Matthew 18, and then again in Luke 22. So some of these overlap and are this recording of the same story, but there's at least three different instances here where they have this conversation. Mark 9, this one's my favorite, I think, because they're on the road... They're walking to their next destination, and Jesus comes up to them. Apparently, there was some degree of separation, at least between the traveling groups. Hey, how was the walk? What were you guys talking about? And they all get real quiet, like nothing. Like when you, when you walk in, your, in the room, and you know, the, all of a sudden, the conversation stops with the, with the kids. You're like, what were you guys doing? Nothing. Nothing. I don't know. I wasn't even here. Uh, the disciples get silent. They're quiet because they're embarrassed because they know the conversation they had is not the type of conversation they should be having. But they kept silent. Nobody wants to answer Jesus. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Now, the disciples are held up for us as models in so many ways. And I hope that you will find this even encouraging, that the Lord takes a prideful group like this, he humbles them and he changes the world through the preaching of the disciples, starting with Peter in Acts chapter two, and then the subsequent ministry of the various disciples around the world. It's amazing. It also speaks to just how pervasive the problem of pride is. It really is, the more you think about this, it really is at the root of every other sin. It's at the heart of other sins that you see come out. It's a hard one too, because pride is almost impossible to put our arms around. What are the metrics for measuring humility? Think about it. How do you measure, okay, I'm more humble now than I was? Because if you're aware of it, that probably isn't actually humility, right? That's why it's so tricky. Maybe if you have an anger issue, you could sort of look at yourself and say, well, I'm less angry now. I feel less of that in my heart, in my soul. It comes out less than it did, let's say, two years ago. Or if you have an issue maybe with gossiping. I just I talk about people too much. I say things I shouldn't say. I share information. And you can look back and say, yeah, by God's grace, I see some progress on this. But what if we're having a conversation and I ask you, hey, how's that pride issue going in your heart? You're like, Nailed it, you know, great week. I, humility, that's pretty much my middle name or my nickname in college, <laughs> as it were. It, it's, this is who I am. Uh, you, you can't say that, it's slippery in that way. And so we all need to be aware of this. And I think particularly, particularly, as you're talking about a ministry context, they enjoyed a relative degree of success already. They're gonna enjoy more success. Don't forget, it's not you. It's not you. So who is the greatest? The greatest isn't that. The greatest is the opposite. They're humbled by this child. This little child is put in front of them. And Jesus says, this is the one, like this. Now let's be clear. Jesus is not saying you need to think like a child. He's not saying that you need to have a lack of understanding like a child. What he's saying, in essence, is you need to be dependent like a child. Children are dependents. They are dependent on adults. It is tax season. So for those of you claiming your dependents, they get you something. Not what they cost you, but they get you something back. Who is the one who's greatest in the kingdom? It's an upside down kingdom, as we talked about before. This is a kingdom, and we could expound this list quite a bit. It's a kingdom where the first are last, 
and the last are first. It's a kingdom where the humble inherit the earth, not the rich. They're not the landowners in the new heavens and new earth. The rich are empty in reality. The greatest is the servant of all. I love Mark 10, 44 and 45, where Jesus makes this abundantly clear. The Son of Man didn't come to be served. To, to, he didn't come to be served, but he came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's the model of true leadership. That's the model that we should be looking for. If you wanna be great in the kingdom, this is how it works. The disciples, they're training. They get bested by this demon. They don't understand certain things about Jesus' teaching. And then they are confronted over their argument over who's gonna be the greatest. Lastly, we see that they're corrected for what we could call their tribalism. They think just because they are with Jesus, they're the cool kids and nobody else has any right to say anything about ministry, particularly not casting out a demon. Notice what it says, verse 49. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not stop him for the one who is not against you is for you. Great statement. So they saw someone casting out a demon. Now note again, as I mentioned a moment ago, I think what this is partly doing is exposing some pride again on the part of the disciples. There's some jealousy here. They got stumped by a demon and then this one is having success. It didn't say he was trying to cast out the demon, he was casting out demons. And they say, well, that's our job. You need to stay out of my turf. And so they try to stop him. This actually has precedent in the Old Testament as well. There's a time when in Numbers, Numbers chapter 11, there were two men who came forward and they were prophesying. They were prophesying. I'll read you part of the verse here. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad. This is Numbers 11. And the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had, that had not gone out to the tent but they had not gone out to the tent. And so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. How dare they? You got these two prophets. They don't have the right paperwork. They shouldn't be doing this. They don't have a permit for prophesying. I need your prophesying permit. How does Moses handle this? And Joshua, or, or Joshua, and Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth said, my Lord, Moses, stop them. And then, but Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Like, I'm the one, I'm the, the leader. Don't be jealous for me. Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. It's good when the gospel is preached and shared. That's the bottom line. It's good when God's word goes out. Jesus is preventing them from thinking that it's not. I think also about Philippians 1.18. Paul is using, he, Paul, Paul is addressing those who are preaching the gospel, but they're doing it from wrong motives. I'll read you verses 15 and 16 and 17, which lead us up to this. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So they're actually preaching Christ, but they're doing it in a way that the motives are wrong. What does Paul do with that? What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. It's good when the gospel goes out. It's good when truth is spoken. It's good, even with bad motives. It's a reminder that we are the clay pots, the Lord is the one who uses his vessels. The power and the message is in the message, not the messenger. Nathan's prayer this morning, he also prayed for churches around the city that are preaching the gospel. Sometimes we pray for like-minded churches by name here at this church. We do that because we're happy to see the gospel go out. We need to balance that, of course, with there's lots of warnings about false teachers. I know that was one of the subjects of equipping hour even this morning. Acts 20, Paul says, there's gonna be savage wolves that come in. You need to be acute, discerning, watchful. 
2 Peter 2, watch out for these guys whose appetite drives them and their God is their own belly. Jude speaks to this. First and Second Timothy, lots of warnings about this. Jesus, he confronted the Pharisees really often. We'll get to more of these a little bit later on. He says, he calls them names like you whitewashed tombs. Now, think about what he's saying for a moment. A tomb is a grave. You're a bunch of, you're a bunch of dead bones, rotting corpses, but you've painted the outside to look nice. Be careful. Watch out for those people. But for those who are simply of a different cohort, maybe of another church, maybe of another tribe, if we will, we rejoice that they are preaching the gospel. We stand with them to the extent that they are preaching the gospel. Jesus concludes this section. that Jesus said to him, do not stop him. Chill out. For the one who is not against you is for you. Now, I just want to glance ahead just for a moment again because we'll get into this again next week. There's some people who reject the message that they preach. And look at verse 54, 1054. I don't think the disciples quite got the lesson yet. Look at 1054. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? It's not the best way to handle your differences. But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. So they, they have this very narrow view of who they are and what they're doing, and Jesus is using this to teach them and to show them. One quote on this from a commentary I was reading that I appreciate said this, Disciples must recognize who the real enemy is and not start fruitless fights with presumed competitors. Fighting the battle against Satan will be lonely enough without skirmishing with other saints. I appreciate that very much. How do we wrap this all up? A few thoughts for us as we head on our way. Number one is this. Pride is a problem. Pride is a problem. Let's just all come to grips with that. That's the theme, I think, that's unifying these four stories. The disciples had a high view of themselves. A high view. So Jesus is using this story of a demon who they can't cast out, He's using spiritual truth that flies over their head. He's using their own argument about who is the greatest. And he's using this issue of these others who are not of their little cohort that are casting out demons to expose their pride. Would that the Lord would expose our pride as well. It's painful when it happens, but I pray that he would. Pride is always a problem. Next. Spiritual fruit requires spiritual means. Let's not make the mistake of thinking that just because we show up, just because you share the gospel, maybe you learn a new way to share the gospel, new sentences and arguments to use. Let's just remember that spiritual fruit requires spiritual means. God must do it. Apollos watered, God gives the increase. Just preaching a sermon, reading the Bible, of course God uses his word, but it's God that must do this. God must produce it. And then lastly, I hope that you've been encouraged, even if we roll our eyes a little bit, at the disciples. Man, they do so well sometimes. And then sometimes you just scratch your head and think, how in the world could they miss that so bad? Arguments, continual arguments about who's the greatest. Like, what are you guys thinking? Haven't you heard anything Jesus said? Rather than just rolling our eyes at them, I think we ought to turn the knife and look at ourselves. And remember that we are much the same way, aren't we? We're much the same way. But it was the Lord who used very normal, ordinary people. They're fishermen, tax collector. They weren't the ones who were supposed to be changing the world. God uses normal people, prideful people even, and he changes the world with normal people. He can surely use you at your office, in your home, wherever it is that you, that you go with your family, He can surely use you as well if he can use this group to change the world. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for an opportunity to be together here today. Lord, we do pray for spiritual fruit, and we do pray even for this message here this morning and the word that's gone out. We recognize that it's by your spirit that fruit is produced. It's not about us, it's about you, and it's about what you've done on our behalf. So Lord, we pray 
that you would use this time for the good of the kingdom work. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Respond to the preaching of the word. We'll sing, Behold Our God.
just for a moment, I have a couple more things that we're going to do. See, y'all thought we were getting out early. <laughs> Church, yeah. Actually, we probably still will. Um, so a few things that I wanted to make you aware of, and then I want to spend a few minutes at the end of our service here praying for our ladies this weekend as they'll be going away on the retreat. Um, one, we have set up what we're calling our Children's Ministry Council. And so these are our council members. I, remind, I love that uh, children's sermon. That was so much fun. Uh, so our council members, and this is uh, sort of an advisement group that we put together. We're working through issues related to children's ministry, giving leadership, direction, vision, things like that. And I'm very grateful. We've had two meetings now. And we just wanted you as a church family to know that they exist. You'll probably see them over there a little bit. And they'll be exercising authority in different roles and capacities. Um, and so we're very grateful for that. So I won't make you guys come to the front, but if you'll just raise your hand. Uh, so Marvin Kravitz. Over here, uh, Andrew and Rachel, so over here, uh, David and Lisa Mordock, I didn't see them today, uh, Corey, uh, Van Hees, is she over next door? Yeah, I saw Corey earlier. Uh, Alan Kendall, <laughs> <laughs> and Leslie Wise, uh, Leslie in the back. Um, and so this is our Children's Ministry Council, and uh, just, just want you to know that that is going on and be aware of that. Also, exciting news, we approved in our last budget, so this would have been in December of uh, 23, um, we approved a part-time assistant, uh, admin assistant position, and just wanted to know, we have filled that position, uh, Rebecca Robertson, in the back. Um, say hi. Woo! So Rebecca, Rebecca and her husband Frank, they have two little girls, uh, you'll see them up here uh, quite often uh, sitting on the front. Uh, Rebecca and, and Frank have been here at the church since 2017, I think a little bit before that, that's when you finished membership. Uh, so quite a while, so we know Rebecca and she's worked uh, closely with Leslie uh, on a number of uh, projects and BBS and things like that over the years, so we're very glad. Uh, to have Rebecca on the team uh, providing part-time uh, support and administrative things. Uh, she'll be working in office admin stuff and then also in our children's uh, helping that as well. Pretty much anywhere Leslie is, uh, Rebecca will probably have her fingers as well, which that is, a, that is a good thing for the church. All right, so I wanted you to know those two things. And then lastly, I just want to take a minute and uh, let's, let's just have a moment of uh, prayer and pray for our ladies um, as they're going away this weekend. Um, I know from my experience with men's retreats and different camps and things over the years, these can just be really powerful times uh, to draw away from the normal distractions and all the events going on in daily life. It's just a really special time, uh, both for the community that you get to enjoy in the conversations and then also the teaching of the Word. So let's just take a minute and pray for those and then I'll turn it back over to David. Lord, as we talked about this morning and saw in the, the example of the disciples, that spiritual fruit is something that you produce. And so, Lord, we want to take a moment and we want to pray for our ladies this weekend as they go away for their retreat. Uh, thank you for Crystal and all the hard work that she's put in to make this happen. Uh, we're grateful for her efforts and all those who have helped her. We also pray for Kristen and for Tiana as they'll be sharing your word this weekend. Uh, Lord, I pray that we would, that they, they would just enjoy some time together, enjoy some time in your word. And most of all, as Paul said, that he planted Apollos water, but you give the increase. And so different ones have worked to both plant and water this weekend. And so we pray that they would be faithful in their roles of planting the seed, the seed of the word and watering that through relationships, through conversations, through encouraging one another, that we pray ultimately for you to give the increase. We pray also for the maybe dads and husbands uh, who are here this weekend as some of them are thrown into some roles and responsibilities maybe they don't always have in terms of child care and uh, just attending to schedules. Uh, Lord, we pray that we would support them in every way um, as they have an opportunity uh, to be ministered to and encouraged this weekend. We thank you for times like this and thank you for the opportunities that you give us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen, church family. Uh, before we go today, I just wanted to share from the text this morning that Pastor Alan preached. I love this response after the Lord Jesus Christ does what all he can do. While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. Worship is the response of a redeemed heart to who God is and to what he has done. The Lord comes along does something only he can do. And the proper response is to be astonished at who he is. And that's 
the answer to pride. When we understand just how amazing the Lord is, right? When we understand, we, we can say to ourselves, He must increase and I must decrease. Amen? So let's stand together and sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Praise God.